Okay, we're into our next chapter in basic beliefs. It's a cappella singing. This paragraph did not come out of the chapter, but I think it's a useful introduction to our thoughts this morning. Maybe we should start out by saying that the term a cappella came into the English language from Latin by way of Italian. It means in the style of the chapel or church. Today it is commonly used to express without instrumental accompaniment. Okay, uh, And if you haven't stopped to think about that, there are plenty of other religious groups who uh, are a cappella, uh, the Mennonites, uh, Plymouth Brethren, uh, many of the Eastern Orthodox churches, and so on. So it's, it's not like uh, it, it's unheard of among others who read their Bible uh, besides us. Okay? We find nowadays, and this is a thought that he opens the chapter with, we found nowadays in many evangelical churches that church worship bands have, be, have come to occupy in many places a more prominent place in a Sunday service than even the preaching. As a result, Lewis notes, it should not come as a surprise that many of our people are unable to explain clearly why our singing is unaccompanied and he added, and in many cases they would not at all be disturbed by the introduction of an instrument into worship. Um, he made these lectures well, well over 10 years ago at uh, White Station in Memphis. If you look in the front of the book, it was printed in 2013. Um, you know, that, that it's interesting to think of it in the context when he said it over 10 years ago because we know in the last 10 years uh, there have been plenty of of restoration churches who've moved in that direction. Old Testament worship included instrumental music. While not all music was intended as worship, and we find early on in the book of Genesis that Jubal, J-U-B-A-L, was the father of all who play the lyre and pipe. So music with an instrument has been around for a long time in all sorts of settings, many of them secular. Moses sang after crossing the Red Sea, Song of Moses in Exodus 15, and Miriam and the women with timbrels and dancing also sang, if you read down a little further in that same chapter, verses 20 and 21. King David brought back the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem uh, after they had been taken by the enemies. Uh, he brought it back to Jerusalem with dancing, shouting, and the sound of the horn. Uh, you remember particularly, or I do, this context in 2 Samuel 6 because of the way uh, Michael, uh, Saul's daughter, who was his wife, reacted to, to David. Let me just read a section of that. Uh, this is in uh, 2 Samuel 6, starting at verse 12. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom. That's where the ark had been stored and everything that he has because of the ark of God. And so David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all of his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. And then the next verse we read about Michael. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, and when she saw the king leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And later, of course, said to him, that was not very royal what you were doing. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, she was barren for the rest of her days, as we uh, read in the text, uh, because of her, her response to that situation. God was not at all unhappy with David dancing and uh, shouting and the sound of trumpets being played and so on. Although instruments are older than King David, their use in worship is often traced to David. First Chronicles chapter 25, First Chronicles 25, verse 1, 
David, together with the commanders of the army, set apart some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun for the ministry of prophesying, accompanied by harps, lyres, and cymbals. And then you, and you list out a long list of people who were involved. And then down in verse 6, All of these men were under the supervision of their fathers for the music of the temple of the Lord with cymbals, lyres, and harps for the ministry at the house of God. So uh, we see uh, all sorts of instruments being used, of course, uh, in Old Testament worship in the temple. Uh, There was also the blowing of trumpets much earlier. You remember back in uh, Numbers 10, trumpets were used really as a signaling device. It's Numbers 10, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and for having uh, the camps set out. When both are sounded, both of these uh, trumpets, the whole assembly, or the whole community, is to assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. If only one is sounded, the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to move out, uh, and and so on. So they use the sounding of trumpets simply uh, to note the availability of them uh, all the way back at that period in time uh, in the wilderness wanderings. The book of Chronicles is quite explicit that David's innovation uh, of instruments was not a human innovation, but was by the command of God. And somehow I'm forgot to put the actual text to the scripture that's on your sheet here uh, at the end of second paragraph. Uh, it's from Second Chronicles 29, verse 25. Second Chronicles 29, 25. Uh, here's what the text says. This was in the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah's reform is described in these terms. He stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with symbols, harps and lyres in the way prescribed by David and Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet. This was commanded by the Lord through his prophets. That's interesting because uh, I remember as a boy sometimes arguments being made uh, and I will talk about those in a minute when I read some from Amos chapter 6 that somehow David had, had merely on his own introduced these things into worship and that uh, he was to be blamed, if you will, for instrumental music in the Old Testament. Such is clearly not the case. It's absolutely authorized by God. It's commanded by the Lord through his prophets. So I'm quoting again from Lewis. This seems to be a passage of Scripture that at least some of our predecessors overlooked as they condemned David as an innovator in their discussions about instrumental music. Let me go ahead and just read that text from Amos chapter 6, and we'll talk about its context for a moment. If I can find Amos. Amos 6, I'm going to read the first six verses. In the NIV, there's a sort of a heading at the beginning of the chapter, Woe to the complacent. And so it starts out with woes. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation, to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to Hamath, and then go down to Gath in Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is your land larger Uh, Is their land larger than yours? You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. Now let me read a little more. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. (coughs) That last phrase, I think, is critical to understanding what Amos 6 is about. Uh, These Israelites were living the high life, 
and were not grieving over sin that they should have grieved over. They were not grieving over the ruin of Joseph. And uh, it's in that context that verse 5, of course, occurs. Uh, what happens typically to that generation who quoted this text so often back in the day was they used it as a proof text and pulled it out of context and said, you strum away on your harps like David and you improvise on musical instruments and the chapter is a chapter about woes. And uh, that was kind of the way the argument was made. Uh, yes? In the old translation, the King James says they invent to themselves. It does. That's true. And that's what they would really... Uh, the fact, invent, right. that, that he kind of came up with it. Yep. All right. So maybe the argument sort of twisted on that one word. Okay. Um, okay. In, this NIV text says improvise. What does the modern NIV say? Same thing. Improvise? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Um, let's keep moving. Uh, I've got another text where I forgot to give you the verse. In the third paragraph, it's from Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. When Israel, led by Zerubbabel, returned from the exile, the foundation of the temple was laid, and we read these words. The priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel, and they sang responsively, Praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. All right? So we notice, uh, we notice symbols. We notice uh, the sons of Asaph being involved, of course, who were those connected with music in the Psalms, which we see so often in those uh, sort of subtitles to many of the Psalms. And uh, they seem to be doing... Uh, well, this this uses the word responsive, okay? Uh, they would sing to each other, all right? Uh, as I see it, probably antiphonal singing. Uh, one side would sing, for he is good, and perhaps the other side would answer back, for his steadfast love endures forever. Uh, we have that in a couple of the Psalms quite clearly. All right. In the Psalms, there is the admonition to praise the Lord with a full-blown orchestra. In that uh, verse you do have, Psalm 150, uh, praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise Him with the harp and lyre, praise Him with timbrel and dancing, praise Him with strings and pipe, praise Him with a clash of cymbals, praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Okay, so uh, that was prescribed by God for worship in the temple. All right, we've talked about Amos 6. Let's move on. The New Testament. Portable instruments of music of various sorts were readily available to Jesus and his apostles had they chosen to use them. There was music and dancing at celebration occasions. Uh, we see that in the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, the daughter of Herodias danced before Herod, which of course led to the beheading of John the Baptist when Herodias had her daughter ask for his head. And uh, Herod felt he had to save face and do what he didn't really want to do. The children in Jesus' parable complained. The one's parable told where it says, we piped to you and you did not dance. And then of course the exact opposite, Matthew, uh, Matthew 11. The flute players had a role in first century mourning ceremonies uh, at a death, Matthew 9, verse 23. And certainly we have the Apostle Paul alluding to the sound of the flute and the harp in his discussion over in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, well, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 7 for a moment. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Okay? And he does that in the midst of his discussion of those who were using uh, foreign languages, tongues, in worship, and uh, doing so with no one 
who had the ability to translate. Okay. All right. Yes. Not, not to go ahead. On that, but I, I've never heard this point made. It means it may be a dangerous point to make. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> but um, in the Greek, the word that's translated "lifeless" mm-hmm. is "asukos." Okay. And that's the only time it occurs in the New Testament. Mm. But it does occur in the Apocrypha. It occurs in the Wisdom of Solomon that that Paul clearly was familiar with because you hear a lot of echoes of the, you know, not quoting as authoritative scripture, but a lot of echoes of it like in Romans. Mm -hmm. And the context in which it occurs in Wisdom of Solomon is relative to idols. And so it doesn't seem to be a positive term. It seems to be a negative term in, in its usage. And it seems to me kind of hard to understand why Paul would use that term for instruments in the mm-hmm. whole context in which he's talking about what's appropriate in worship, even though he's not talking about the singing per se at that particular point in time. Right. But if the church used instruments, it seems hard for me to understand why he would call them lifeless. Lifeless instruments. Right. Okay. Yep. Interesting thought. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Next paragraph. <clears throat> Despite the use of instruments in the Old Testament worship and despite the availability of instruments in New Testament times, instruments are never mentioned as being used in worship in the New Testament. Following the Last Supper, before Jesus and his disciples went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Matthew 26, verse 30, the text says they sang a hymn. Paul and Silas were singing hymns in the Philippian jail at midnight, Acts 16. In writing to the Corinthians, Paul affirms, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Paul, when writing to the Roman Christians, quotes a psalm uh, in Romans 15, verse 9. I will sing to your name. Paul speaks of one having a hymn when the congregation assembles. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. One has a hymn, uh, another was a reading, another a prophecy. Uh, he talks about the participation in worship. Um, there's also the well-known passage from Ephesians 5, uh, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music with or from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Always a kind of an interesting verse to ponder um, in, in terms of the Spirit. Uh, we, we would capitalize and spirits, <laughs> uh, alcoholic spirits. Uh, don't get drunk on wine. Get drunk on the Spirit, really, is what Paul uh, seems to be saying. You should be filled with the Spirit. And when you are filled with the Spirit, uh, then singing occurs. The parallel passage in Colossians 3 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And of course, the writer of Hebrews speaks of Christians offering to God through Jesus the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name, which certainly would include singing. Would be singing alone, but certainly would include it. Is it not strange... Lewis asked that after all that is said about instrumental accompaniment in the Old Testament, one has this complete silence in the New Testament as far as Jesus, his apostles, and the early church are concerned. Portable instruments were readily available to Jesus and his apostles had they chosen to use them. The argument that the poverty of the early Christians uh, was why they didn't have instruments doesn't carry much weight. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not expensive to, to own a flute or a bugle or uh, a cymbal or something like that. No great cost would have been involved in those things. So you can't make the argument from poverty, as some have tried to do, and say, well, the early church was just so poor they didn't have instruments in worship. A great deal is also made in some circles of the fact that four-part harmony was not known in singing in the first century. These folks who make this argument parallel its use as an innovation comparable to the use of instruments. Uh, But 
Lewis notes a passage from Philo of Alexandria uh, in his description of the Therapeute that seems to need consideration. By the way, the Therapeute uh, were not Christians. They were more contemplative aesthetics who lived near Alexandria. Uh, but you'll get the point, I think, of the quotation when we read it and we'll understand why Lewis brings it up. After describing in some length the music meeting of these folks, Philo of Alexandria, who, by the way, passed away in uh, AD 50, so we're talking about <coughs> the first half of the first century and what he's describing here. He wrote, It is on this model, above all, that the choir of the Therapeute of either sex, note in response to note and voice to voice, the trouble of the women blending with the bass of the men create an harmonious concert, music in its truest sense. The point seems to be Philo knew the difference in singing between the male and the female voice. And while he didn't describe four-part harmony, he does seem to be describing two-part harmony, particularly the fact that the treble of the women is blending with the base of the men. He goes on to say, uh, at least there is more than unison sing singing occurring here in a first century setting. However, be that as it may, <coughs> the shift from unison singing or chanting, which is often alleged, well, the early Christians just chanted, to a four-part harmony is still vocal singing. It's not bringing in an instrumental accompaniment. The earliest non-biblical description that we have of Christian worship is that of the governor of Bithynia, Pliny of Bithynia, who was writing to uh, the emperor Trajan. And he reports that Christians sing a hymn to Christ as God. For some today, the Old Testament usage of instruments is a very persuasive argument for its use in the church. But, and he puts the question this way, is it not worth noting that neither Jesus nor his disciples ever, uh, ever hinted at the use of an instrument either as an act of worship or as an aid to an act of worship? We just don't find uh, any uh, authorization in our Bible for that in the New Testament. Some musicians, and you've no doubt heard this, have argued that God gave them the skill to play their instrument, and so they're going to use that skill to praise the Lord. Um, to show the fallacy and maybe uh, how ridiculous that argument is, uh, Lewis says, God also gave some people the skill to box. Is one going to do that in worship? He gave to another the skill to play basketball. Shall one do that in worship? To another he gave the skill to play football. Shall one do that in worship? And on and on it could go. All of us have various talents. Uh, the question is, uh, are those things to be a part of worship or not? Just because a person can do something well does not mean that it has a place in Christian worship. Uh, and then he has a paragraph where he uh, talks about uh, a little bit about the giving of gifts. I had to giggle a little uh, because I have a first cousin over here in Fort Worth who wrote on her Facebook three or four years ago, uh, well, her husband Rusty just gave me a wild game camera. I guess he'll be getting a pair of diamond earrings for his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here, here's, what, here's what Lewis wrote. He said, If I'm going to give my wife a present, I'm not likely to give her something because I like it or want it. I would not, for example, get her a circular saw or an acetylene torch. I would find something she wants. If I'm going to offer something to God and I want him to be pleased with it, then I have to offer what God has specified that he wants. Singing God has specified instrumental music in New Testament times, he has not specified. Further, Lewis says, people seem unable to understand that something approved in the Old Testament could be disapproved of in the New Testament. 
but take the, the matter of animal sacrifice. There's no New Testament passage that specifically condemns animal sacrifices. Thou shalt not slaughter a goat or a lamb. New Testament passages do show that their purpose was accomplished in the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Uh, think about everything we read in Hebrews. With that sacrifice being made, it's superfluous to offer sacrifices that cannot take away sins and with, with which God would not be pleased. Early Christians did not do that, which is useless. Burning incense was a part of Old Testament worship, but no provision is made for such in New Testament worship. Both the Greek Catholics and the Roman Catholics regularly offer incense in their services. Uh, the Lord is praised in the dance in the Old Testament. We saw David dancing uh, before the Lord. No provision is made for that in the New, Test New Testament. Today there are churches, of course, which are engaging in dancing as a form of worship. Also religious processions occupy an important role in certain forms of worship. Though those processions are sometimes very colorful and impressive. Again, Lewis says the New Testament knows nothing of, of the sort. Some people are, seem also perplexed about singing uh, when they read about music in heaven in the book of Revelation. And so he turns his attention to various texts in Revelation. First, one needs to notice explicitly what is said in Revelation. In Revelation 1.10, the text says that John hears a voice like a loud trumpet. Not a trumpet, but like one. John also hears a voice like many waters. Revelation 1.15. Seven trumpets do sound as a part of the action of the book in Revelation 8, uh, but those trumpets do not have anything to do with singing or worship. Probably the use of trumpets more in the sense of what we saw in Numbers 10 a moment ago. Signaling. In Revelation, there is singing not described as accompanied by instruments. All that is said is singers. And let's look at this text, Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and open the seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And they sang a new song. In addition, the voice I heard, this is Revelation 14, uh, John says, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpers playing on their harps, and they sing a new song before the throne. Uh, he says, this is a simile where sounds are said to be like instruments, but not instruments themselves. Uh, and then he kind of reached back into the past a bit. He said, uh, he could envision something perhaps like Keith Lancaster's group a cappella, where instrumental sounds were made with the human voice. Just the thought that came, came across that uh, he decided to uh, put in his notes. Maybe that was the case. There were, then there are the four living creatures, Revelation 5, with harps and bowls of incense. There are the seven angels, with the harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So you've got angels singing, uh, but apparently angels, uh, at least in the vision, with harps in their hands. There is also secular music mentioned in Revelation. Uh, Revelation 18.22, uh, in reference to... Uh, the sounds in Babylon, if I can get there, 1822. The music of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters 
will never be heard in you again. Uh, in this context where when Babylon is thrown down, uh, all the things that made up life in Babylon uh, will cease to be. And certainly uh, musicians, harpists, flute players, trumpeters, all those things uh, are gone. And so Lewis concludes, Revelation 15, verse 2, <clears throat> that if the accompanied singing of the angels that we saw back in chapter 14, if the accompanied singing of the angels authorizes instrumental accompaniment and worship in the church, then it would also authorize the use of incense because the living creatures had bowls of incense. Uh, but of course, Revelation said the bowls of the incense, when you understand the figure, it are the prayers of the saints. So that's the difficulty you get into when you start uh, literalizing aspects in the book of Revelation. All right, so then he turns his attention to some arguments. He notes that the argument against the use of instrumental music is the same argument as that against other non-authorized types of worship that we've already listed. We want people to show us where instrumental music is authorized in the New Testament, and if that cannot be done, which it cannot, he underscores, then to show us why we do not need to have scriptural authorization for it. And surely Lewis then adds, these two alternatives should not be hard to understand. Either you've got authorization or you don't. It's popular to argue, I do not see any place where the use of instrumental music is condemned in the New Testament. And he simply says, no one is arguing that anyone's going to find a verse that says, thou shalt not use instrumental music in Christian worship. The argument and logic is that where the Lord gives a command, then that eliminates doing anything else. And that's come up three or four times in the course of lessons throughout this book. Most obvious, of course, being Noah and the ark, that he was to use a certain kind of wood. The two sons of Aaron, who took unauthorized fire and tried to offer it before God and were uh, killed by the Lord. Or the fact that the Old Testament priests always had to be the Levites, as stipulated by God. The New Testament does not pretend to contain a list of all the things people should not do in worship. Popes, cardinals, and archbishops are not prohibited by a specific you shall not, nor are infant baptism, sprinkling for baptism, the use of incense, dancing, and a good many other practices prohibited, but none of them are authorized. A person always needs to ask, where does the Bible authorize this practice? While it may seem strange today for a 21st century church not to have instrumental accompaniment to singing, the New Testament church did not have such for centuries after its establishment. People worship in song, which is why it was called or is called a cappella, as in the style of the church. Now, a few quotations uh, from the early church fathers. And if you've not pondered this very long, you need to. Uh, the early church fathers who lived in close proximity uh, to the apostles and maybe in a few cases even rubbed elbows with some of them, uh, what they had to say should be of interest to us because it would reflect how they read and understood and practiced the New Testament. Clement, and I assume this is Clement of Rome, wrote... Let us then give him praise, not only with our mouth, but also from our heart, that he may receive us as sons. Justin Martyr. We offer solemn prayers and hymns for his creation and for all things leading to health. Prayers and hymns. And then in the Sibylline Oracles, and I left an L out of Sibylline, should be two L's. In the Sibylline Oracles, in gracious psalms, and songs fitting for God, to him thee, the immortal and faithful, are we bidden, God the creator of all, the omniscient one. At the end of the second century, A.D., Clement of Alexandria was arguing against instruments. 
here's his quote. <clears throat> did I put that on your sheet? Forgotten. Yeah, I did. We, however, make use of but one instrument, the word of peace alone by which we honor God and no longer the ancient psaltery nor the trumpet, the tympanum, and the alos, as was the custom among those expert in war and those scornful of the fear of God who employed string instruments in their festive gatherings as if to arouse their remissness of spirit through such rhythm. In a last thought, near the chapter's end, Lewis notes this. He said, I find it tragic and ironic that just at the time many of our people seem ready to adopt instrumental music, a preacher from the Reformed Presbyterian Church has come out with an attack on its use as not having scriptural authority. And uh, do you own this book, by the way? Is, is he talking about the new I don't know? No, Brian Swartley's book. I, know. I, don't, you, have I don't have it either. But yeah. there, but there, just recently, uh, he, and I mean, I think 2005, a, um, a Reformed Baptist preacher up in New England okay. came out with a book called Old Life on New Worship. Okay. And in it, uh, he details his case against instrumental music and why his church ceased the use of it. Price is his name. Okay. Uh, I looked up when Swartley wrote his book. He wrote it in 1999, uh, so it probably already been out about 10 years when he gave these lectures. <clears throat> and the title of his book is Musical Instruments in the Public Worship of God, probably only available uh, as a used book online, uh, but an interesting book, no doubt, to read uh, someone who uh, was Reformed Presbyterian who says uh, we need to just have congregational singing, vocal music. Um, that was pretty much what was in the chapter. I looked at another quote from, uh, from uh, Bruce McClarty in an article he wrote that appeared, I think, in uh, the Gospel Advocate and probably somewhere else a few years ago. He quotes the church historian Eusebius, and he, he came along a little later. Eusebius lived from 263 A.D. to 339, so we're talking uh, late 3rd, early 4th century. Anyway, we had this commentary on uh, Psalm 91. Of old, at the time of those of the circumcision were worshiping with symbols and types, S-Y-M-B-O-L-S, by the way, those kind of symbols and types, it is not inappropriate to send up hymns to God with the Psalterian and Cathara and to do this on Sabbath days. So he's talking about Judaism. We, however, render our hymn with a living Psalterian and a living Cathara with spiritual songs. The unison voices of Christians would be more acceptable to God than any musical instrument. Accordingly, in all the churches of God, united in soul and attitude with one mind, and in agreement of faith and piety, we send up a unison melody in the words of the Psalms. So well, that was uh, Eusebius. Okay. Uh, and McClarty in that article breaks, breaks down really three areas of complaint in his mind where, uh, where uh, instrumental music sort of doesn't fit the bill for New Testament worship. First of all, it's association with the Old Testament. Uh, it's association with externals, yeah, uh, that it, that it uh, was very much to do with the, the senses and, and uh, you know, the smells of incense and the kinds of things that went on uh, under the Old Covenant. And uh, thirdly, it's association with pagan festivals. Uh, which is one that we probably don't often think about, uh, the instrumental music involved in pagan uh, festivals, which ultimately may have played a big part in uh, its final sort of acceptance into Christendom. It was Pope Vitalian, from everything I've ever read, uh, that says we had the first recorded example 
of the organ being introduced into a church was in 666 by that pope, uh, at, at least recorded. Uh, some, some may have had it earlier, but that's the first time we actually have a record of it. Apparently there was controversy <coughs> with that, and it wasn't widely accepted because by the time of Thomas Aquinas in about 1200, mm -hmm. he argued that the church doesn't use instruments in worship lest they seem to Judaize. Oh. And you know he was in a position to have you know broad knowledge of what was going on across you know the church. Okay. So. So really, you've got to come pretty much to the second millennium right. before the introduction on a broader scale of instrumental music in Christian worship. Everett Ferguson, who wrote a uh, wrote a classic book on uh, acapella singing, uh, had the following to say: the whole self talking about music in general, the whole self, including the emotions, is involved in Christian worship, but the mind, reason, is, in, is to be in control. Instrumental music can express feelings and emotions. Vocal music can express the will and the intellect. The latter, vocal music, is better suited for the communion of spirit with spirit, small spirit, our spirit, with God's spirit. In vocal music, there is an immediate contact. All right.